Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're viewing this. Um, my name is Ben Cowley. I'm at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center in Oklahoma City. And today we're going to talk mainly about dialysis. But to understand dialysis, I think you need to understand a little bit about what kidneys do so you can understand what dialysis does and does not do for you when your kidneys are failing. Once again, that's me, um, and you can see the nice picture in the background. Uh, these are the obligatory disclosures. Um, I, in an effort at full disclosure, I am a uh, consultant for Otska Pharmaceuticals. And this is what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about what kidneys do, what are the consequences of deteriorating kidney function, what happens when kidneys reach end stage? And I put that in quotes and you'll understand why in a few minutes. Um, though we won't be talking about it, um, there are obviously several ways of treating end stage kidney disease. Probably the best is transplantation. You'll have an opportunity to see a presentation on transplantation and I urge you to do so. What we'll be talking about today is dialysis We'll talk about what dialysis does do for you and what it does not do for you. We'll talk about how dialysis works. We'll talk about different types of dialysis, how to choose a dialysis modality, and most importantly, how to stay healthy when you are on dialysis. What do kidneys do? Well, obviously one of the things kidneys do is they make urine. And what urine is, is waste products that our bodies need to get rid of. Waste products such as water, electrolytes, meaning salts, which you see here, and other toxins that can make you sick when they accumulate as your kidney function deteriorates. The other thing our kidneys do is they produce hormones, and those hormones are important. One of those hormones is erythropoietin. We call it EPO for short. It promotes blood formation by your bone marrow. Your kidneys activate vitamin D, which is important in the maintenance of healthy bones. And your kidneys also produce a hormone called renin, which is important in regulation of blood pressure. As kidney function deteriorates, you get disrupted urine production. And what that leads to is accumulation of a variety of things. Obviously, you begin to accumulate water and sodium, meaning sodium chloride, which is table salt. Um, Accumulation of water and salt leads to high blood pressure. If it's severe enough, it causes shortness of breath and it can cause swelling, um, typically in your lower extremities, but when it's more severe, it can, uh, you can swell um, in any region of your body. We treat disrupted water and sodium accumulation by asking you to limit dietary salt. Um, People talk about limiting fluid intake, and that's helpful, but really salt intake is the more important thing to restrict. If you eat salt, you will be thirsty and you will drink. If you restrict your salt intake, you'll have less trouble with, with uh, thirst. Um, we also will give medications called diuretics. Many people call them water pills. What diuretics do is they encourage your kidneys to get rid of salt and water follows and then if you do have high blood pressure, which most people with impaired kidney function uh, do have high blood pressure, we treat that with antihypertensive medications. In addition, as urine production is disrupted, you accumulate potassium. Potassium um, can be particularly problematic if it gets to high levels because it can cause abnormal heart rhythms, which can be potentially dangerous. Um, you will be asked to restrict dietary potassium, and you may be given diuretics, which also induce not only sodium, but potassium excretion by your kidneys. Um, if your kidneys are unable to excrete adequate amounts of potassium, we may give you oral medications to prevent you from absorbing potassium um, from the food that you eat, and there are several that are on the market. They're listed here. And then as urine production is disrupted, other electrolytes become dysregulated. Um, you may become deficient in calcium, which uh, causes abnormal bone metabolism. Um, 
we treat that with uh, dietary supplementation as well as vitamin D supplementation. Diet, vitamin D is important for absorption of calcium from your intestines. Um, phosphorus or phosphate tends to accumulate and that uh, also causes abnormal bone metabolism and it promotes cardiovascular disease. And um, it also causes itching. Um, we treat phosphate accumulation by asking you to restrict foods that are uh, high in phosphorus. And typically we also give you oral medications to take when you eat that bind phosphorus in your food to prevent you from absorbing it. And then finally, acid accumulates. One of the waste products that your kidneys are supposed to uh, remove is acid. And that also causes abnormal bone metabolism. If acid accumulates uh, to the extent that it's problematic, we may actually give you oral alkali, literally sodium bicarbonate, baking soda, um, to neutralize uh, acid in the food that you eat. And then finally, there are a whole host of toxins which we can't really measure very easily that accumulate when uh, your kidney function is impaired. Um, they cause things as simple as uh, bad breath, itching. They can cause loss of appetite, weight loss and malnutrition. As it becomes more severe, you can have nausea and vomiting. You can see inflammation of internal organs, what we call uh, pericarditis if it's in the heart. You can see intestinal bleeding, difficulty concentrating and confusion. And if it's severe enough, you can have seizures. Now, obviously we want to prevent essentially all of these, but particularly the more serious consequences. And so we don't wait until you have serious consequences to do something about deteriorating kidney function. And I mentioned that there are other things that the kidneys do besides the make urine. Um, the hormones that I mentioned become disrupted. Um, you may uh, become anemic due to a deficiency of erythropoietin, and that can be administered um, uh, supplementally as an injection similar to, similar to an insulin injection, although it's not given that frequently. Um, we may give you vitamin D, as I mentioned, and uh, blood pressure typically becomes dysregulated, and we, we treat that um, High blood pressure, if it's poorly controlled, increases your risk of heart attacks and strokes, and it also promotes deterioration of kidney function. So there are several reasons to treat blood pressure as your kidney function deteriorates. As your kidney function deteriorates, there are several things that we monitor closely. We monitor how much fluid is in your system, what we call your volume status and your blood pressure. We monitor your nutritional status. We'll, we'll monitor uh, blood uh, blood tests that are associated with bone disease. We'll monitor your uh, hemoglobin and, and manage your anemia. And then we actually look at how effectively your kidneys are removing waste products so that we can plan for the future. What happens when kidneys reach end stage? And, and I put this in quotes um, because in some ways, end stage kidney disease is kind of a per, pure, poor choice of words. Um, your kidneys may continue to function as your kidneys deteriorate, but at some point they may not function well enough to maintain health. And that's the point at which we uh, uh, determine that you've reached, quote, end stage. Um, most people continue to make urine even when they've reached what we call end stage. End stage is when your kidneys are no, lo no longer working well enough to keep you healthy. And that's when we consider transplantation or dialysis to be necessary. Having said that, we don't wait until you need dialysis or transplantation to begin planning for that. We plan well ahead of time for either transplantation or dialysis before you need it, because if we wait until you need it to have a plan, it becomes much more disruptive to your health and your lifestyle. Having said that, as I mentioned, your kidneys may continue to function even after you have started dialysis and that remaining kidney function can be important. The, the things that we look at to determine when uh, kidney function has reached end stage are listed here. Basically, when we can no longer con control fluid overload, when we can no longer control potassium accumulation, when we can no longer control acid accumulation, 
And when we see those other toxins begin to accumulate, what we call uremia. Um, uremia is that syndrome where you lose your appetite, you have nausea and vomiting, you begin having difficulty concentrating. We don't want to wait until you actually are manifesting uremia to have a plan or even to, to begin dialysis. We typically like to begin dialysis before uremia occurs. Typically, end-stage kidney disease occurs when kidney function declines to about 10 to 15% of normal. There are certain things dialysis does not do. Dialysis alone will keep you alive, but it will not keep you healthy if all you do is dialysis. To stay healthy when end-stage kidney disease requires transplantation and medications and changes in your diet, or it requires dialysis and medications and changes in your diet. So to stay healthy when you are on dialysis requires more than just dialysis. And when you um, begin dialysis or, or even well before you begin dialysis, but when you're certainly on dialysis, there's an entire team of healthcare professionals that will help you stay healthy. There's not only a physician, there'll be nurses, dietitians, social workers that help you understand what's necessary to stay healthy when you are on dialysis. Dialysis removes waste products, but there are certain waste products that it does not remove effectively. Phosphorus is one of them. I mentioned that when phosphorus accumulates, it promotes bone disease. It also increases cardiovascular disease. And so dietary phosphorus restriction remains important when you're on dialysis and oral medications to bind phosphorus in, your, uh, in the food that you eat remain important. Um, vitamin D and related drugs are also important in that regard. Dialysis does not correct anemia. To do that, we give supplemental iron and we give supplemental, supplemental erythropoietin. And though we do remove fluid and salt with dialysis, there are limits. Dialysis control, controls excessive fluid accumulation relatively poorly. And so one of the things that tends to make people feel poorly when they're on dialysis is if they accumulate too much fluid and salt and we have to remove it, um, and that's, that can make things challenging. Because of that, restriction of dietary salt and fluid remain important, and most people continue to require medications to control their blood pressure. So what does dialysis actually do for you? As I mentioned, it removes fluid, but there are limitations. And it removes chemicals in that fluid. It removes electrolytes and it removes toxins. And we strive to do that in a way that avoids dramatic shifts in electrolyte and fluid balance. We wanna try and do this gently to the extent that we can. And we strive to do it in a way that minimally interferes with a patient's life. All types of dialysis require, obviously, some sort of access to the patient. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. And it requires a membrane across which water and waste products are filtered. And I'll show you some diagrams here in just a moment. It requires dialysis solution, which what we call dialysate, to collect the waste products and the fluid that we're removing. And that, that dialysate is um, in very close uh, proximity to the patient. It's, it's, it's separated from the patient only by that, the, the dialysis membrane. And because of that, we require very sterile constituents in the dialysate, water, sterile water and sterile chemicals. And then the final thing that dialysis requires, it requires that we monitor the patient's status regularly to make sure that we're adequate, adequately removing toxins, that we're controlling electrolytes properly, that we're controlling the patient's volume and blood pressure, that the patients remain well-nourished, and we wanna make sure that the patients continue to feel well and are functioning well. All types of dialysis require what you see here. Basically, it requires a membrane, what we call a semi-permeable membrane, on one side, you have blood, and on the other side, you have the dialysis fluid that I mentioned is composed of sterile water as well as sterile chemicals. On the blood side, 
you have red blood cells, you have toxins, you have electrolytes, you have proteins, and you have water. This membrane, as I mentioned, we call it semi-permeable because it will allow small things to move across the membrane. Small things like toxins, electrolytes, water, but large things like red blood cells and protein typically do not flow across this membrane with certain exceptions, and we'll talk about those in a minute. But for the most part, this membrane is designed such that it lets small things, water, salt, small waste products into the dialysis fluid, which is what we discard. There are basically uh, several ways of looking at dialysis. One is simply the location. Um, most people in the United States um, dialyze in centers, basically dialysis clinics where you go to, un to, to have dialysis. Um, dialysis has become an industry. And because of that, there are dialysis centers in many small communities all across the country. It's not quite like Burger King and McDonald's, but it's close. The other way, the other place you can dialyze is dialyze at home. And, and though the percentage of people that dialyze at home is much smaller, um, these people in some ways tend to do better because they tend to be more engaged in their own health care. And then the other way that we look at dialysis is the actual type of dialysis modality, either hemodialysis or blood dialysis, or what we call peritoneal dialysis. We're going to talk about both. With hemodialysis, blood is removed from the patient. It's pumped through an artificial kidney, what we call a dialyzer. And then the clean blood is returned to the patient. While the blood is in the dialyzer, fluid, electrolytes and toxins are removed by the, dial, by the dialyzer. Um, the semi-permeable membrane that I mentioned before is artificial, it's manufactured. And if, if you cut, this is a picture of a dialyzer, blood enters one end and then clean blood leaves, leaves the other end. The dialysis fluid enters in a different way and then dirty dialysis leaves and is discarded. If you cut this dialyzer in cross section, what you see inside are a lot of little tiny tubes, um, basically blood-filled fibers. The blood goes through the inside of these tubes and the dialysis fluid is on the outside of these tubes. These tubes are composed of that semi-permeable membrane that we talked about. It's artificially manufactured. With hemodialysis, at any one time, there's only about a cup of blood, about 150 to 200 milliliters of blood out of the body at any one time. Uh, a typical individual has about five quarts, five liters of blood in their bloodstream and up to 40 or 50 quarts or liters of fluid in the patient. The waste products accumulate in all 40 quarts. If we wanna cleanse 40 quarts of fluid, and we've only got about a cup of blood out of the body, we need to run a lot of cups of blood through the dialysis machine. What that means is we run uh, blood through the dialyzer between 300 and 500 milliliters per minute, basically one to two cups per minute. Because of that, stable access to the bloodstream that will allow this type of blood flow is critically important, what we call vascular access. And in some ways, vascular access is the Achilles heel of hemodialysis. Vascular access comes in several different types. If we need to emergently dialyze someone who does not have vascular access, we can literally at the bedside place a temporary, what we call percutaneous non-tunnel dialysis catheter. It can go either in the neck. We no longer really use the subclavian vein for technical reasons. It can go in a vein in the neck. It can also go in a vein down in, down in the groin and that catheter can be used immediately. It's extremely temporary. You cannot leave the hospital with this catheter, but it can be placed and used immediately after use. A somewhat related but more stable access is what we call a tunneled cuffed catheter. Um, a tunneled cuffed catheter enters the skin tunnels in the fatty tissue under the skin, and then it enters the vein either in, in the neck or in another location. Between where it enters the skin and where it enters the vein, there's a cuff, and that cuff may be anywhere between where it enters the vein and where it enters the skin. 
scar tissue grows into this cuff to anchor it so that it, the catheter does not fall out. And it provides uh, a barrier against infection. Now, that barrier is not perfect. Um, though you can leave the hospital with this catheter and you can use this catheter for extended periods of time, it still should be considered temporary. These catheters are associated with a significant risk of infection, and they also tend to not work well. They tend to clot, and even if they're not clotting, they don't always provide adequate blood flow. So they are not a good, suitable, long-term solution for vascular access for hemodialysis. A more suitable long-term access is what we call an arterial venous or an AV graft. What an AV graft is, is the surge, you'll have a surgeon take an artificial blood vessel, this graft, they connect one end to an artery, they loop it around and then connect the other end to a vein. The blood flows through the graft from the artery to the vein continuously, even when you're not dialyzing. When dialysis is necessary, we place one needle on one side to take out the dirty blood, a second needle on the other side to return the clean blood only while you're dialyzing. When you're done with dialysis, the needles are removed and this graft is under the skin. So the only thing you see is the graft and skin covering the graft. These are a good long-term solution, although they do not last forever. For a variety of reasons, they tend to clot um, you can um, dissolve the clot, but you can't, and reestablish flow through the graft, but you cannot do that an infinite, infinite number of times. These grafts only last a few years, and you've got a limited number of places to put these grafts. So though they are a good, stable access, they're not the best. The best is what we call an arterial venous fistula. With an arterial venous fistula, the surgeon literally directly connects an artery to a vein, either at the wrist, sometimes at the elbow. The pressure in the artery is directly transmitted to the vein. The vein dilates, it gets bigger, and the wall of the vein becomes thicker. It develops a, a, a more substantial muscular layer. And once that vein is big enough and mature enough, once again, we put one needle in to remove the clean blood, a second needle in to return the dirty blood only when you're dialyzing. When dialysis is completed, the needles are removed and all you see is skin. Now, an AV graft can be used fairly soon after it's placed. Um, with certain types of graft material, you can use these right away, although most nephrologists would prefer to leave them alone for a few weeks before they're used. An arterial venous fistula takes months before it's ready to use. Um, it takes a while for the vein to dilate. It takes a while for the wall of the vein to get thick enough to um, allow uh, a needle to be placed without leakage of blood. And so this is the kind of thing you would, de you would be inclined to create long before you actually need dialysis. A good arterial venous fistula can be your lifeline. I knew a young man who developed kidney failure when he was uh, in college. Um, unfortunately, he had the type of kidney disease that recurred with transplantation. He did not have PKD. He had a different disease. He received a transplant. His kidney disease rapidly recurred and he lost his transplant. So he was relatively certain that if he received another transplant, his disease would recur again. He used the same arterial fistula for 26 years. 26 years. He had to have it revised a couple of times, but a good arterial venous fistula can last you a lifetime. As I said, it takes a while before it's ready to use, so this is the type of thing we try to anticipate when you're going to need it. We try to place this months before you'll actually need it. This is a picture of a standard hemodialysis machine, although you can't see this individual's uh, vascular access, and that's actually a party foul. Um, we actually like to see your vascular access while you're dialyzing so we can uh, make sure that there's not leakage of blood and other problems. But basically, most likely under this uh, sheet, which really should not be covering the access, there's one needle to 
taking the dirty blood out of the patient. It goes through the dialyzer, and then there's a second needle, and the blood is the clean blood is returned to the patient. This is uh, clearly in a dialysis center because you can see another chair here. This individual is coming to the center typically three times a week. Um, and they dialyze and then they go home. Um, if you're doing in-center dialysis, as I mentioned, typically you'll dialyze three times a week, either Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. A typical session is three to four hours at a time. It allows rapid removal of fluid and waste products and rapid correction of electrolytes. Once again, fluid is an issue. If you're only dialyzing three times a week, you have two and over a weekend, three days to gain fluid. We've only got three to four hours to remove it. And so one of the things that makes people feel bad with hemodialysis is if they gain excessive amount of fluid um, and we have to take off a lot of fluid in a short period of time. So restriction of salt and fluid intake is gonna make you feel better when you're on dialysis. There are certain dialysis centers in the country that will do dialysis at night. Literally, you come into the center in the evening, um, you are uh, hooked up to the dialysis machine and you dialyze typically six to eight hours overnight and you sleep in the center. It allows for more gradual removal of fluid and waste products and more gradual collect, uh, correction of electrolytes. Um, not every center in the country does that, but most large cities will have uh, at least one, if not more centers that do what we call nocturnal hemodialysis. And you can do hemodialysis at home. Um, there are several things that are beneficial in terms of dialyzing at home. If you compare people that are doing hemodialysis at home to people who dialyze in a center, the people who dialyze at, at home typically have better nutrition. They have fewer hospitalizations. They typically have longer survival. It increases your independence because you're in control of your dialysis schedule. These people are typically more likely to be real rehabilitated, meaning being back at work or back in school, in school, and they typically feel better. So there are several advantages to doing home dialysis. Um, in the distant past, decades ago, uh, when I was a young man, um, people actually would have a standard hemodialysis machine in their home. What that meant is they had to have a water purification system in their home because remember, you need to have very, very, very clean, pure and sterile water to do dialysis. And so these people would have a water purification system in their home. Um, that's still available in a limited number of centers across the country, but it's becoming less and less common. More commonly, people will use um, a newer type of dialysis machine um, for home use, which uh, either uses pre-prepared sterile dialysis solution, or there's a unique dialysis preparation system. And I'll show you a picture of this new dialysis machine. In terms of the frequency of home dialysis, if you're doing traditional home dialysis with a conventional dialysis machine, you're typically gonna dialyze three times a week, just like you would in the center, and you need a trained partner. And the reason why one of the side effects of hemodialysis, especially traditional hemodialysis, since we're taking fluid off fairly rapidly, your blood pressure can become very low. And if you're on dialysis and your blood pressure becomes low, we need to give you fluid back. If you're in a center, the nurses will do that. If you're at home, you need a partner to give you fluid back to bring your blood pressure back up. If you're doing frequent dialysis, either daily or more frequently, not all programs actually require a trained partner. There are a few centers across the country that will actually allow patients to do hemodialysis at night while they're sleeping, and not all programs require a trained partner. Um, that's not available in all centers across the country and not even in all cities across the country, but it is an option in some locales. Um, this is a picture of this newer dialysis machine um, you can see that this is the machine itself. It's not actually being, in, it's not in use at this time. This is what the machine looks like when it's not in use. This black cube that it's sitting on is a special uh, machine that actually prepares dialysate, clean, pure um, fluid to be used uh, for the dialysis procedure. 
this is how it looks when it's in use. Um, these are actually bags of dialysis, of dialysate. This is uh, the other way that fluid can be provided for this machine. Instead of using this black cube, you can actually use bags of fluid uh, for dialysate. Um, this machine, as I said, uses either pre-prepared sterile dialysate or this unique uh, dialysate preparation machine. Uh, it uses this relatively unique uh, machine. Um, most people that do this will dialyze um, four to five days a week. Um, and not all programs will require a training partner to do this. Um, occasionally people will use this machine to dialyze at night. Um, and once again, not all programs will require a trained partner to do that. Complications of hemodialysis. If we have to remove fluid in a rapid period of time, we can cause cramping. And once again, that's another reason why limiting salt and fluid intake in between dialysis sessions is gonna make you feel better. As I mentioned, there can be drops in blood pressure, especially if we're removing fluid too quickly. You can have headaches. If we're removing fluid too quickly, we can cause nausea and vomiting. Many people feel washed out after dialysis. If we're not paying attention to the electrolytes properly, you can see abnormal heart rhythms. And then we're obviously sticking needles where they don't belong, whether you're using a tunnel cuffed catheter, an arterial venous graft or arterial venous fistula, we're gaining access to your bloodstream on a frequent basis. And so infections are always a potential complication. Because of that, we are very careful to use sterile technique when we're doing this, but there's no perfect technique. And so infections are seen in patients with dialysis. We're very, very sensitive to that issue. The other type of dialysis that we do is called peritoneal dialysis. There's an empty cavity in your abdomen lined by a membrane that's called the peritoneal membrane. That cavity is normally empty. It's filled with a little bit of lubricant so your intestines can wiggle around while they're digesting your food, but it's typically for the most part empty. That peritoneal membrane can be used as a semipermeable membrane to do dialysis. Basically what we do is we put fluid into that peritoneal cavity. And so we put clean fluid in, let it sit there for a while, Waste products move into the fluid, and then you throw the dirty fluid away, and then you repeat. This semi-permeable membrane allows the removal of excess fluid, electrolytes, and toxins. It is done at home. This is another form of home dialysis. Um, you don't need any helper because this can be done, you know, by, it's done typically by the individual patient and the, when you exchange fluid, it can either be done manually during the, during the day or by an automated machine at night. Um, this is what it looks like, although this is sort of cut and cross section. This is the uh, abdominal cavity. The, the organs in your intestines are in gray. This black area is the peritoneal cavity, um, which is normally empty. The way this is, the, the way access is performed is you actually have a surgeon place a catheter. It doesn't look exactly like this. This is cut and cross section. This catheter enters the abdominal wall. It tunnels under the skin for three to four inches. Um, and then it enters the abdominal cavity. Between where it enters the skin and where it enters the abdominal cavity, there's a cuff, um, sometimes two cuffs. Um, scar tissue grows into that cuff to anchor the catheter so it does not fall out and to provide a barrier against infection. Technically, you can use that catheter immediately after it's placed. Most nephrologists like to limit, the, limit or avoid that and wait a couple of weeks for this catheter to, to scar in. Um, but this catheter can typically be used within a couple of weeks after it's placed. Um, in between exchanges, the catheter just has a cap on it. When it's time to do an exchange, if you are doing manual exchanges, you connect the catheter to a system that has a bag full of clean dialysis, and then you don't see it. At the end of this drain line, there's an empty bag. Your abdominal cavity will already be full of fluid. You connect 
this system, which has two bags, this bag will be clamped, this bag will be clamped. You connect, you open the clamp on this line and you drain out the dirty fluid into the empty bag. You then clamp this line, open the clamp on this line, and then you fill up. Once you're full, you clamp again, you disconnect, and you put the cap on. Now, this is all done in, in, with sterile technique. You're wearing a mask while you're doing it. This is how peritoneal dialysis first started. Manual exchanges, typically done four times a day, basically breakfast, lunch, supper, bedtime. Um, a manual exchange typically takes between 15 and 20 minutes, depending on how rapidly your, your catheter will drain and fill. You can still do that. There are a few patients that continue to do manual exchanges just because it fits their schedule better than doing an automated cycler. But most people today um, actually will use an automated cycler. And I'll show you, show you a picture of that here in just a minute. Um, when you're doing peritoneal dialysis, your physician will typically determine how much fluid you put into your abdominal cavity and that's mainly a function of how, how effectively you're removing waste products. Typically, it's between two and three liters per exchange. Your doctor will determine the number of exchanges each day, and they'll determine the type of dialysis that you're doing, either manual exchanges or automated. The reason for that is that an automated machine that only dialyzes you at night may not effectively remove waste products, because if you're only dialyzing at night, that's eight to 10 hours of dialysis. And, you know, 16, you know, 14 hours during which you're not doing dialysis. And so how you dialyze either manual exchanges or automated is going to be determined by your physician because they will be monitoring how effectively waste products are being removed. There is control by the patient with peritoneal dialysis. The, the, the individual patient will determine the type of dialysis solution that we use. And, and primarily that's a function of how much fluid you need to remove. When we do hemodialysis, the machine actually creates a, hydro, a hydrodynamic sucking force. It literally sucks fluid across that semi-permeable membrane to remove fluid. We can't create a sucking force in your abdominal cavity. And so what we do is we put something in the fluid that creates what we call an osmotic force, basically um, a, a, a molecule that's not particularly well absorbed that causes fluid to remove from your bloodstream into the dialysis cavity. That substance needs to create an osmotic gradient. It can't accumulate and it can't be toxic. Um, based on those criteria, the ideal flu or the ideal substance would be albumin Albumin doesn't satisfy the last criteria is it has to be cheap because you throw it away every time you do an exchange. So what we typically use is we use sugar. We use glucose in the dialysis fluid and the dialysis fluid comes with different concentrations of glucose. The higher the glucose concentration, the more fluid you will remove. So because of that, the patient will determine what type of fluid to use when they do an exchange, depending on how much fluid they want to remove. There is another molecule that's sometimes used. It's a little bit larger. It's, it's a, a poly sugar. It's, a, it's a, a chemical that has many sugar uh, molecules linked together. It's called icodextrin, and it's a little bit more effective for fluid removal. Um, it's more expensive, so it's not used for all exchanges. As I mentioned, when peritoneal dialysis first was developed, it was done with manual exchanges, what we call chronic ambulatory peritoneal dialysis or CAPD. Manual exchanges of fluid are done by the patient. As we said, you hook up, you drain into the empty bag, that's dirty fluid, you fill up with clean fluid, and then you throw the dirty fluid away. And then you do that four to five times per day. You can still do that. It's offered by all, all uh, peritoneal dialysis centers. Um, but most people decide not to do that just because it's more convenient to use an automated machine, what's typically called automated peritoneal dialysis, sometimes called cyclic peritoneal dialysis. 
and you basically hook up to a machine. You can see this machine right here. It's about the size of a briefcase. There's a bag of fluid sitting on top of the machine. The machine actually warms the fluid before it goes into the patient. And the machine cycles fluid in and out of the patient at night while the patient is sleeping. As I mentioned, if you're only doing this at night, you're only dialyzing for eight to 10 hours at a time. And so that may not allow for adequate toxin and or fluid removal. Sometimes people will do a hybrid. They'll do automated dialysis at night and they'll carry fluid in their abdomen during the day. We'll sometimes even have patients do uh, use an automated machine at night carry fluid during the day and do a manual, a manual exchange in the middle of the day. And we're doing this all in an effort to make sure we're adequately removing toxins and waste products. Complications of peritoneal dialysis, as I mentioned, it, sometimes it just does not remove either fluid or toxins adequately. And so peritoneal dialysis may not work for all patients that's unusual. Usually we can do not design a peritoneal dialysis prescription that will work for the vast majority of patients. Once again, infections are an issue. If you think about what's in your abdominal cavity when you're doing peritoneal dialysis, your abdominal cavity is warm, it's wet, and it's full of sugar. There's no better medium for creating infection. And so we have to be very careful to be sterile or the patient has to be very sterile. Uh, careful to be sterile, not to introduce infection. There are different types of infections. Sometimes we can cure them, sometimes we can't. If it's a simple bacterial infection, we can frequently cure those with antibiotics, but more serious infections with certain types of bacteria or fungi typically require removal of the catheter. One of the things that we typically forget to tell patients because we take it for granted is it just because you start one type of dialysis doesn't mean you're stuck with it. People go back and forth between hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis all the time. If someone's doing hemodialysis and they have trouble with their vascular access, they may switch to peritoneal dialysis for a while. If someone's doing peritoneal dialysis and they develop an infection which we can't treat, we remove the peritoneal dialysis catheter and they transition to hemodialysis for a while. People go back and forth between different types of dialysis modalities all the time. One of the other complications of peritoneal dialysis is malnutrition. I mentioned that the peritoneal cat or the peritoneal membrane acts as that semi-permeable membrane. It's actually a fairly leaky membrane. It's leakier than the membrane used for hemodialysis. Proteins actually move across that, that uh, semi-permeable membrane in your abdominal cavity. Every time you do an exchange, you lose about an egg's worth of protein when you're doing peritoneal dialysis. So to be a good candidate for peritoneal dialysis, you need to be able to eat well and particularly eat protein. And so we monitor that very closely in patients with peritoneal dialysis. Some of you may have heard about the wearable artificial kidney. I, I mention it only because some of you may be curious about it. It is still very, very experimental. It's not uh, ready for uh, prime time, although people continue to work uh, to develop a, uh, a, a viable external artificial kidney. Um, it looks something like this, and you can see why this is still only a prototype. This isn't the kind of thing that people would wanna wear continuously, but it's, it's sort of proof of concept. Um, you may have also heard about what's called the bioartificial kidney. Um, a bioartificial kidney is a hybrid. It actually, there's um, sort of plastic and, and a membrane with cells grown on the membrane, actually uh, um, kidney cells grown on the membrane, which allows removal of waste products um, artificially. Um, it comes in several different varieties, uh, what's called an uh, acute bioartificial kidney, which is used in people with sudden onset of kidney failure. There's a wearable form and an, impl and an implantable bioartificial kidney. Um, this is what an implantable bioartificial kidney would look like. It would have a connection to an artery, would go through this artificial kidney and then a connection to a vein. And then there would be a separate tube where the artificial urine would flow. 
once again, this is still very much an experimental, although exciting technology. Um, whether, you know, at some point, whether or not this will be a viable option for most patients, I think is not yet known. How do you choose what type of dialysis to do? Well, there are a lot of things that go into that choice. Some of it has to do with lifestyle issues. Um, if you don't live close to a dialysis center, you're probably going to want to do a, a home dialysis modality. If you live in a, a rural community, you, the closest dialysis center may be two hours away. When I was a young man, you know, when dialysis was, was not yet an industry, there are people that live five and six hours away from their nearest dialysis center. So, you know, lifestyle issues go into how you choose a dialysis modality. Um, proximity to a dialysis center. Whether you have a suitable partner to do home hemodialysis, although with newer home hemodialysis modalities, not every program requires a partner. As I mentioned, not everybody um, has a peritoneal cavity that will, that will adequately remove waste products. If you've had multiple infections of your peritoneal cavity, it may scar down. If you've had multiple abdominal surgeries, your peritoneal cavity may be inadequate to accommodate adequate volumes of fluid. In terms of hemodialysis, as I mentioned, vascular access is kind of the Achilles heel. Um, it may become challenging to create vascular access. Having said that, people with PKD are generally reasonable candidates for any type of dialysis, even peritoneal dialysis. Although your kidneys may be enlarged, that doesn't necessarily preclude doing peritoneal dialysis. The, the decision ultimately is something that each individual patient needs to make a decision about in conjunction with their physician. Once again, we don't always mention it because we take it for granted, but patients transition between different types of dialysis every day for a whole variety of reasons. Just because you choose one type of dialysis doesn't mean you're stuck with that type of dialysis forever. Staying healthy with with end-stage renal disease. I mentioned when we started this discussion that dialysis alone will keep you alive, but it will not keep you healthy. If you have renal failure and all you do is dialysis, you will deteriorate. To stay healthy with end-stage kidney disease requires either a kidney transplant and medications and changes in your diet, or it requires dialysis and medications and changes in your diet. Patients with kidney failure are particularly at high risk for vascular, including cardiovascular, meaning heart disease. Because of that, we will ask you to restrict dietary sodium and phosphorus. We will, at, we will work to control your blood pressure. We will work to control your lipids, meaning your cholesterol and triglycerides. We will suggest that you exercise to the extent that you are able, and for God's sakes, don't smoke. So we've talked about a lot of things. Staying healthy with kidney disease requires all of what you see here. Kidney transplantation is typically a better way of treating end-stage kidney disease, but it's not the solution for everyone. As I mentioned, you will have an opportunity to see a presentation on kidney transplantation. I urge you to do so. Dialysis is also the other way of treating kidney disease. Neither transplantation nor dialysis are a cure for kidney disease. They are very effective treatments, but as I mentioned, whether you're doing transplantation or dialysis, it requires medications, changes in your diet. There will be an entire team of people that will help you stay healthy, whether you have a kidney transplant or you're doing dialysis. There will be physicians, social workers, dietitians, nurses, a whole host of people will help you stay healthy. I hope that each and every one of you are able to avoid end-stage kidney disease, but as most of you know, approximately half of the people with polycystic kidney disease will develop kidney failure severe enough to require dialysis or transplantation. If that happens to you, I wish you health. Thank you for listening. Take care. <laughs>